All right, let's get back in here on Diamond Conversations here on Place to Be Nation Podcasting Network on the Place to Be Nation Pop Feed. If you didn't know by now, my name is Ian, and every single week we sit down to have a Diamond Conversation with somebody from the world of Major League Baseball, and this week it's a great one, and I am so excited to welcome in a man who pitched in over 330 Major League games, the pride of of Tom's River, New Jersey, the one and only Mr. Mark Leiter. How are you tonight, Mr. Leiter? Wow, feeling um, humbled by your words there. Those lies you just said. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm actually in Fork and River, New Jersey now, and we grew up in Pine Beach, and we always would I'm only It made me think when Al was, um, when Todd Frazier went over to the Yankees, and he says to my brother, Al, he goes, man, why are you always saying you're from Tom's River? You guys ain't from Tom's River. But if we tell people <laughs> Bayville, they're like, where's that? You ever hear of Tom's River? Yeah, near there. So you just say Tom's River area. But we grew up <laughs> in beach in New Jersey, but little towns. But it's close to Tom's River, so we would just say Tom's River. How about the pride of Ocean County? How's that sound? If I could be the pride of my house, I'll be happy. <laughs> No, that's great. But uh, no, great to have you on tonight. I appreciate you taking some time. You're sitting outside on a beautiful night there in uh, in Bayville or Fork River, wherever wherever you said you were. And it's uh, it's so nice to chat and uh, and be able to talk about a little baseball at a time where we just heard baseball is back. Yeah, exciting. You know, are they sure now? I think now we're sure. I think it's it's July nineteenth is opening day. All right. Yeah, I didn't think it was going to ha- I started thinking, nah, it's not going to happen. It just didn't seem like it was uh, it something better than nothing. Why not? I mean, is it going to be screwed up for the history of the game and records and all the blah, blah, blah? But all that does is just keep discussions going and everything else. Well, if they played a full season that year, whatever. So that's always fun for sports. But I think having something is totally b- – I don't give a damn if it was going to be 30 games. Just something for these people that are stuck at home. I live out in the woods, so I ain't stuck at home. It's quarantined. It's like, you know, don't matter. It matters to millions, and that sucks for it. But for me, I'm outdoors all the time. But the people who are missing their sports, they got to have something. So I'm happy to uh, at least get some season in. And they teased us along the way because uh, first we heard it was going to be June, and then it was the end of June, and then it was early July, and it wasn't happening. And now that it's – looking to be happening, you know, 60 games, like accelerated. It's like March Madness in July, August, September. So there you go. But you know what? Yeah, it'll be like the NBA and, and uh, hockey. Everybody makes the playoffs. Just put everybody and, and new. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and now you got things like the universal DH. So there's changes coming like to the game. I don't now, like so you don't like that. That was going to be what I was going to ask you. You're not a fan? <laughs> not, a, not at all. Not at all. When I was playing – I. I I signed in 83. I, gra- I graduated high school in 81. That was my last at-bat, 1981. I didn't go to the National League till 1985. So right. I was 15 years in between at-bats. Um, so when I was with the Tigers, uh, I was with the Tigers for three years in the early 90s. And Bill Gullickson, one of my awesome teammates, um, great, he had a great career. So he would always say to me, because he saw how, like, the, me and my brothers, we just grew up baseball. The Reader's Baseball Digest, the Sporting News back in the day, you know, all the older guys. This week in baseball, Saturday mornings, it, everything. We, we knew the history. We knew the guys' numbers from everything, from baseball cards, baseball encyclopedia in the house. So Gullickson used to always say, Light, before your career's over, you've got to get to the National League. It's so much better baseball. So in 95, 94, the Tigers released me in spring training. I probably had I probably had the second or third best numbers in the entire on the whole pitching staff. And I got released. Right. Kind of bullshit. Oh, am I not allowed to do that? No, you can say oh, what you good. want. So, so do you think that after 60 games of this uh, DH or the NL, do you think that it's going to stick now? Do you think this is it? The DH. Yeah, you mean, is it the DH going to stick? Yeah, yeah. After this, you think it, 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 this is the new reality? But they want to do. They want to have the DH. That's what I was going to say. So play, when I got to go to the National League, finally, man, it was awesome because I pitched inside. I threw a lot of sinkers. I, you know, I had a decent fork ball and a decent sinker, so I got to – so I hit a lot of guys. But in National League, I had to get up. So there were times I got in the box thinking, shit, man, this dude might smoke me right here. Um, it, it – 
it made a big difference. Plus, getting up to the plate as a pitcher, it teaches you about pitching that it ain't that easy to hit the ball. You know, you, it's not that easy, but it is easy to hit mistakes. I, I always tell these kids when I do lessons, I had 21 hits in the big leagues. I batted 112. 20 hits were off fastballs. One was off a changeup. Yet they want everybody throwing 95, 100 miles an hour. When the only pitch that everybody can really hit is a fastball. It's timing. Once you time it, you're going to hit it. Unless it's right. a well, but if it's a well located fastball, it's really difficult to hit. But when you see these guys, and I, and this is one of the turnoffs to me. And I, I know I was an average pitcher. I know that. People can say I suck. Whatever they want to say, I don't give a shit. I will say this, though. When I watch a game today and I see the guys throwing 97, not the DeGroms because they are filthy. Scherzer, those guys I'll watch all day long. But the average guy with the 96 mile an hour, 97, you watch how often they hit the glove with their fastball. They're reaching back. They're humping up. They're trying to hit 100. I just don't see it as pitching as much as it was in days gone by. But I do believe with DeGrom and those those studs, studs are going to be studs no matter what. Um, anybody can hit a fastball. But the DH thing as a pitcher – you got to pitch inside. You got to protect teammates. You're going to hit guys. Sometimes it's on purpose. If one of your one of your guys gets hit, and you know it's on purpose. You're going to hit somebody on the other team. Um, in the National League, you got to get up, so it's a little scarier. You're kind of way in the back of the box. Which way am I going to move if he throws at me? So I love that part of the game. You want to eliminate when guys don't like throwing at you. Make the pitcher get up. So I don't like it one bit, and it turns me off a little bit more with all these changes. But they don't care about old guys like us anyway. They're trying to get the younger crowd. Strikeouts and home runs, you know, that's – I don't like – Yeah, like I even think from the reliever aspect too, I mean, even though you're not really facing many pitchers as a reliever coming in, it just changes the whole strategy, you know, if you've got now another bat in that lineup that maybe, you know, a, a guy that might not have been in a National League lineup who's not going anywhere, and it just changes the whole strategic part of it, even for, you know, a manager who, quote-unquote, may not even be managing the game in the same traditional way anymore. It's just it's a lot of changes to be hit with in a shortened, accelerated 60-game schedule. I couldn't agree more. You know, um, if you think, like, I, well, when I look back at those Toronto Blue Jays Cito Gaston had, 92, 93, I think there were guys that didn't get at-bats for, like, weeks. He had this. Yeah. That, that's he put seven guys on the all-star team the one year I was I think I was a little he shouldn't have done that but he did <laughs> they had they had a great team you didn't need to change you didn't need a pinch hitter at least in the national league pitchers are going to get to pitch more well now they only want pitchers throwing what 12 pitches a game they're babying their arms more guys are hurt now than they were in the past so that's all bs too but um you had more guys getting in games the lefty extraordinaires coming in to face one guy you don't really need that um you got a DH. I mean, with, with the DH, you don't have to pinch hit. There's no double switch, so you're not getting guys going into the outfield. Okay, it's the double switcher. Guys got to play in the National League. They're into the game. If you're just going to sit and watch and hope you get to play occasionally, I don't get why guys would like that. I think the union is making a huge mistake, and, and they're saying it's about, as far as the DH goes. They're looking at it like this. Well, it's more money for a DH. Okay, so you're going to pay one stud to be a DH, and you're going to be greedy that way. But you're going to make how many guys in the dugout pissed off because they're hardly getting any at-bats. They're not even right. getting left field for defensive – whatever it is, they're not getting in the game. And I'm, it's bullshit that they constantly go about the money, the money, the money. How much do you need, for God's sakes? 300 million contracts, and, and, and I get it. It's free market. I get it. I get it. We all get it. It's free market. Get what you can. But, boy, it sucks when you got seven guys in the team that are just pissed off. They're not happy. It forms clicks. It does a lot of things. It's a negative thing, and the union's going to agree to it because their argument's going to be it's more money for a DH. But what BS is about that, that's a lie, I think, because look at the guys now that are going to get released that were made that, that, that uh, what was his name? Uh, Lenny Harris, awesome dude, right? Yeah. Great, great. You don't need a Lenny Harris on your team anymore now if this is what's going right. to happen. Lenny Harris was a National League guy. Mark Carrion, I think he broke the uh, pinch hit at bat record at one point with the New York Mets back in the day. Uh, how many pinch hits he had? Uh, you got to, but if you have a DH, you don't need that. You don't need to hit for the. You know what I mean? So, so now you're going to release guys that may have been not making a. Well, I think two million is a lot of money. If a guy's making two million bucks in the dugout, because you don't need that guy anymore. Let's pay a bunch of guys the minimum. You're not going to. If this is the case, then get the minimum salary up to a, a couple of million dollars. Because it's going to be nonsense. There's no reason to have that middle-of-the-road guy anymore. There really isn't. I don't like it. 
And I think there's a lot of guys, but nobody cares what a 50 something year old thinks. Yeah. And it's funny too. Cause you know, the Mets just traded for a guy from Houston who now maybe he's not going to even get in the lineup because Cespedes now has a spot as a DH on the team. So it changes the whole entire strategic makeup of whatever spring training was supposed to tell us about what these guys were. You're a hundred percent on the money with that. I don't like it. I don't like it. I just don't. It turns me off. It's just like, okay, the worst. But then again, you know, the older guys do like the strategy of hit and runs and all of that and not just waiting for the, uh, your launch angle and all da, 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 and how far can you hit it? I used to hit home runs in BP all the time. In fact, one of my biggest thrills was hitting my first home run at Shea Stadium in BP. <laughs> Beautiful. It yeah, I, couldn't pick it any other way. <laughs> wanted to run the bases, but it was on the road. It was my first time in the National League, and I went deep. I hit it in the left field bullpen, and I couldn't help but think, damn, Cleon Jones standing out there in 69, catching that one. True. Pretty, pretty cool. Hey, so Mark, the uh, the way that you talk about kind of how these rosters are constructed, uh, you know, I want to bring up your son, Mark Leiter Jr., uh, who had some success with the Phillies, who is uh, who came, you know, overcame a big injury, pitched for the Blue Jays, and he was in, in camp with the Diamondbacks this year. But they're talking about uh, doing some like taxi squads this year, where they're just going to have thirty guys yeah. practicing fresh near the uh, you know the home ballpark this year. Yep. Do you think that that benefits? Uh, a player like your son that has had his ups and downs the last few years that, you know, uh, got released by the Diamondbacks in that big cut at the end of May. Uh, you know, what happens to a guy like him with this new restructuring? That ain't good. Um, <laughs> you know what? That's a tough one. Uh, for, for, you know, I'm going to talk about my son. That's always going to be a tougher thing. He signed with Somerset. And I, I said, man, you got to get someone. You need innings because he's throwing great. He feels great. He's throwing great. He's a he's an awesome pitcher. Um, he needs innings. And so I think there's, what, 1,200 free agents, somebody told me? Is that about right? They release 40 to 60 guys pretty much, every organization. I mean, there's a ton of free agents out there. So yeah, for yeah, him, about right. as of now, he at least got to the independent ball. Yeah, so that's what they're going to do. So this doesn't help someone like my son at all. What helps my son is that he's going to be in an independent league because he needs innings to show, hey, I'm healthy. It's hard to take a guy like Mark and say, well, we don't. he didn't pitch last year. So we need somebody, when somebody gets hurt, that we know was pitching last year. So the only way that's going to happen is for Mark to – he would have started the year off in AAA and then get your way back to the big leagues. So by being in Somerset or the independent league, he'll get his innings. You're going to be being scouted not only by the States but Japan. South Korea. Um, and the bottom line is it's baseball, man. So wherever you're playing, if you're not 20, 22 years old, you're not going to the Hall of Fame unless you're a visitor. You got to be in the big leagues very young to get those numbers to be a Hall of Famer. So yeah, it'd be nice to be in the major leagues. But to be honest with you, if you're playing baseball, you're playing baseball. Whether it's in your backyard, wiffle ball is just as much fun as anything else. So he needs innings. I think it's going to hurt a lot of guys because the free agency market is flooded now. Um, yeah, the whole, that, that part of it sucks. That, that part, there's not much you can do because of what time of the year it is. We're only doing a 60-game schedule. That's a tough one. I don't know if I answered what you're saying. Um, I don't know that it you know, no, you know how I, it can help anybody to be. Absolutely. Uh, do you expect, uh, do you expect, you know, the way that they're, they're working with the 60-game schedule, do you expect a lot of, you know, like an influx and injuries here? Like, how does a guy stay warm? for these last three or four months without facing competitive ball and then have to heat up in two weeks. You know, I was going to joke there and say, well, I'm counting on injuries to get my son back there, but that wouldn't be very nice. I won't. <laughs> um, <laughs> injury, and you know that there's guys home right now that didn't take it seriously, didn't think there was going to be some kind of season, so maybe they cut back on workouts. Who the hell knows? Um, I guess you could go back to the 90, what was it, 1990, the late – the late opening and they only had a three week spring training. Well, we yeah. did that. 1990. We did that in 95 as well, though. Now that I think about it, we had the late spring training. We only had, we'd start, I think it was like a month late. We didn't start the season. It was about a month late, right? In 95. Yeah. So I, 95 as well. Yep. Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember a lot of injuries, honestly. I mean, you, you, other than your teammates, you're not really thinking about who's getting, at least I didn't really pay attention. Your teammates, you know, who's getting hurt and yourself. But um, I don't remember. There's always going to be injuries. 
You know, I mean, uh, no matter when the season starts or doesn't start, there's look, if you have a long spring training, guys get hurt at the end of spring training. Oh, if spring training wasn't so long, there wouldn't have been, you know, it's the, who knows? Uh, that's and plus they, the way they're they're they don't let pitchers throw a lot, so I don't see that happening. So the injuries I see more, you know, hamstring, that kind of stuff, guys. Maybe guys didn't think to be a season. They started lifting more than they normally would this time of year. That's possible. So if guys are lifting more than they normally would, they might be tight when they go into this mini camp or whatever it is. What are they going to have, a three-week spring training? I don't even know. Yeah, it's like accelerated spring training pretty much. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah opening day is July 24th. Oh, really? I think that's when I made my major yeah. league. July 24th. Um, yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I thought. Um I don't know. I, I don't know. It depends how guys took care of himself. Like I look at my son, he's been working like a madman with the throwing. We've been throwing batting practice. We had Todd Frazier here throwing and, and a couple college kids. I mean, hitting. So Mark's gotten some real good uh, BP and taking it, not telling each other what you're throwing. You know, he's, he was pitching. It's all out. Um, so he's prepared. He's been treating it like the season's on with, with batting practice, uh, his bullpens. He hasn't missed anything. Cause I got a, like I said, I got a thing in my backyard here, a bullpen indoor thing building um so he's been doing his bullpens when the weather's bad or it doesn't matter we so, you know i don't know how many guys are doing what he did because i know he talked to a few guys that didn't work out like they normally would because they didn't think there was going to be a season so yeah yeah i guess i could see yeah, injuries but we'll see yeah so here's one thing that when we were yesterday is that we were getting set for the interview, you know, I, I was doing some research and doing my uh, digging on Mark Leiter. That's why I know his debut was on July 24th, 1990. But the thing that I found fascinating was you were out for a few years uh, with one of your injuries that you had to your shoulder, I believe. You worked for the Ocean County Corrections Facility for three years. What was that like transitioning from baseball to working inside of, uh, of a correctional facility uh, and a different kind of beast? That's how I got to the big leagues. After about four months being there, it wasn't a horrible job. It was a little depressing. Like, eh, I ran these guys all day. Um, but it also made me um, work harder than I ever thought I could work to try to get my arm better. But, I, uh, yeah, that was some crazy crap. To, to work in the jail and then make a comeback in A ball, I was 26. Um, that was amazing. I'll tell you a funny story about that, though. After my career in 2003, I was sitting at one of my son's games. I think it was 2003. Yeah, I played till 2003. So 2003, I'm at one of my son's game and this guy is sitting right next to me. I sat right next to him. And he says, um, after like a couple of innings, he finally goes, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, I don't. Car pulled up. Must be my daughter. So he goes, you don't know who I am? Don't recognize me? I said, no. He goes, um, and he whispers, he goes, you used to work in the jail when I was in jail. I'm like, get the hell out of here. What were you oh, for? Oh, man. He, uh, <laughs> picking and entering, you know, I had tough times in life. He goes, but that, he said, we used to play backgammon and chess together. Oh, my God. I, you know, the guy's how many years older? I said, I do remember you. So when times were slow, there were so many inmates that just made mistakes in life. You know what I mean? They're good guys. And listen, I hope they don't make me sound, but I'm just saying there were some guys that just screwed up. And he's one of them because he never went back. But he ended up doing, he ended up doing three years, three and a half years. He, so he says to me, he goes, about five months before he got out, we're watching ESPN and all of a sudden they go, we see you up on the thing. We're like, wait a minute. Isn't that the guy in <laughs> jail? I said, get out of here. He goes, Mark, I'm not kidding. Everybody that was there, because the county jails will pay. I don't know what they do anymore, but you know, you pay the county to keep inmates rather than put them in raw way or whatever the other state prisons or anything. So some guys were there more than a year and two years, right? But how funny, this guy's telling me, and I remember the guy, because just the past time, sometimes on a boring day, you know, there was nothing to be done. I'd go in and play chess, and I'd go do a walk and whatever and go back in, you know, same thing with the back end. I love back end. But how funny. This guy's watching ESPN. Doesn't even know why I left the jail. I went to have another surgery. I'm like, I'm not doing this shit the rest of my life. I mean, God bless the, those guys that work there because it's, it's, you know, it's not an easy job. But I just thought, eh, let me try the baseball thing again. 
Um, but to have somebody sit there and say, we're watching, we're sitting in the jail and we're like, Mark Leiter, how funny is that? So here I was in the jail and two, cause I, when I made my comeback, it was 1989. I was in AAA right. 90. I got called up. It was like, it happened so fast once I made the comeback, but these guys remembered me and pretty funny. That, what are the odds of that? Right. But so when you were deciding to go down that route, did you look into coaching at that time or was you just kind of wanting to tap out of baseball for a little bit? No, I didn't want to tap out at all. I didn't have a choice. My arm was killing me. The Orioles doctor did two surgeries. He cut my arm in eighty in like June of May of 86, probably May. And then I want to say, I don't know if you have it there, but my second surgery, I think it was November of 86, which I never could understand. Why the hell did this guy cut my arm, major surgery, and then arthroscopic, arthroscope, arth, what do you call that, arthroscopy? Arth arthroscopic, yeah. Yeah, he did that in November. I think he didn't think I'd ever pitch because he sent the letter to Hank Peters, the GM, saying, um, I recommend Mark find a new line of endeavor I'm like after the first surgery. So if that was the case, he must use me as a guinea pig because he didn't. He was intimidated by Dr. Andrews and all them, which I screwed up. And I went to Andrews the third time when I left the jail and boy, oh boy, you know, made the comeback. Um, so, yeah, I didn't. Uh, it certainly wasn't my choice to get released, but that's the way it game goes did they give you a timetable though did they say you know mark it's going to be x number of you know, months years you, you you just got it done and that was it for three years <laughs> yeah uh yeah well yeah they started thinking it was in my head i remember uh, tom giordano the farm director saying you know mark he was beating around the bush you know mark sometimes when a guy's an injury he's a little nervous to throw it i said where are you going with this man well, i don't get it he goes you know psychology i said oh you want me to see a shrink i said you know what if he fixes his arms i'll sit down with anybody <laughs> that's and, great yeah, I mean, I don't care. I, I, you think I don't want to pitch? I was on the 40-man roster at 22 years old. I'm like, I'm headed for a big league career at 22. What do you mean I don't want to pitch? I'm scared to throw. Um, yeah, they screwed me. Uh, it's a long time ago, but they uh, – dumb shit that they did. Um, so no one ever gave me a timetable. What I loved about Dr. Andrews was when I went to him um, – after he had done my surgery, and I went to him about six months later for a checkup, and I was throwing pretty good, but nothing. And I said, well, where did you expect me to be at this point? You know, I don't know. I don't have a time tag. I don't know what I'm doing. And he had a little grin. He goes, I didn't think you were coming back. I'm like, what? You told me, you know. He goes, yeah, well, if I told you I didn't think you were going to make it, would you have worked as hard as you are? I'm like, probably not. He goes, so whatever the hell you're doing, keep doing it. And sure as hell, man, the Yankees, I, uh, I pitched in some semi-pro game in York, Pennsylvania. And uh, a scout I knew had me at 88, 89 on the old Ray gun. And next thing you know, I threw for the Braves, the uh, uh, the cut White Sox I was going to throw for down in Sarasota. I think they were in Sarasota back then. And Al said, well, before you go, my brother Al goes, before you go, why don't you throw for um, Brian Sabian, farm director with the Yankees? And uh, I did, and I was 89-91 at Yankee Stadium in the bullpen. What an experience, because I'd never been on a big league field before. It was in their locker room. They were on the road, so I got to go in the locker room, put on my gay uh, 80 shorts that went up to our uh, ball sack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, like, gee, we all looked a uh, little, you know. So, um, yeah, and the ha high sand. <laughs> the knee, yeah, you right? can't knock the style. You can't knock the style, Mark. It's, it's, it's pretty normal. <laughs> um, yeah, so I got to throw in the bullpen. It was the. It was oh my god! I'm in Yankee. If I never play again, I'm in Yankee Stadium in the bullpen, throwing a freaking bullpen for this guy. So Brian goes, you know what? I like what I see, but you got to come back in four days and do it again. I got to make sure you don't need two weeks off. I went back in four days, did the same thing. They signed me to a contract. I went to A ball the next year. I started off in A ball and from there I ended up in, tr I did really well. Only was only there for about a month. Um, but you know, going back to the jail, like this is where I remember like what I learned from the jail was this. Don't bitch about playing baseball ever. And I remember we had this young guy, I'm not going to say his name, but he was a young guy. He was 22 and I, and I would just turned 26 and he was always bitching about being, Oh, I should be in double A. Like everybody does. I should be in double A. I should be, I should be, I should be. So one day I just got sick of it. I said, hey, man, why don't you take all your shit off the uniform, put it in your locker, put your street clothes on and go home and work for your father. I know because he was always coming back to work for my dad. I said, go ahead and do that. I said, you know what? In two years, you'll be begging to come back here for that uniform. And he, so he finally looked at me because I was kind of being a dick. And he goes, well, how do you do? Aren't you he goes, aren't you embarrassed? You're 26 years old. I said, let me tell you something. 
as long as there's scouts behind the backstop, a manager and a pitching coach in each dugout doing a report on me after the game, you're going to have to rip this uniform off of me. I ain't going nowhere. And sure as hell, my brother Al was in the bigs with the Yankees, gets traded to the Toronto for Jesse Barfield. Clay Park, right. AAA to the big leagues. They need a guy in AAA. And I was like pretty much lights out and A-ball. It was like I was – I don't know why. I just overmatched every, all those kids. I go right to AAA, and I went nine and six. The next year, I'm getting called up to the big leagues. It was surreal. It was like, wait a second. I was just working in a jail. Didn't think I'd ever pitch again. Was out of the game. Didn't pitch for three years. And, and But I remember a couple of younger guys, when they got to the bigs down the road, they said, hey, man, I always remember what you said in the uh, locker room at that kid. As long as there's scouts watching and someone's doing a report on you, you go balls out constantly. You never know what's going to happen. You know, my son's a good example of that. He don't throw 100 miles an hour. He has odds stacked against him. He knows how to pitch. Fighter. And that's that's a great, yeah, it's a great way to get through a career, you know, life, the whole nine yards. But it's funny, too, with Al, like, you got you just missed him. You know, there he, he wasn't traded. There's a good chance you guys end up playing together at some point in the, the, the 90 season or even in 89 because you just missed him in Columbus going up to the Yankees, and then you're up to the Yankees, and he's in Toronto. So you just missed him by a hair. <laughs> asked for a trade because he knew I was going to catch up to him. So he, I think he asked for it because when he was a free agent, we could have played in San Francisco together. They told him they'd match. They, you know, they're like, Hey man, we'll match any offer he gets. And he ended up signing with the Marlins when they went out and bought that world series, but you can't, yeah, buy, oh yeah. I take that back. I apologize to the players. You can't buy a world <laughs> before you can buy some pretty freaking good baseball players to get you into the playoffs and all of that. And then unload them unceremoniously throughout the next two seasons in like, you know, succession pretty much. Yeah, he, he, the Dolphins were his team, and he didn't give a shit about the baseball team. And then Al and I were together again in spring training in 2001, one of the funnest springs yeah. I had. I got being with my brother there. I, I was teammates with my brother Kurt in the A-ball. Um, we were teammates in Hagerstown, Maryland. We both played for the Orioles organization back in the day. And that's a perfect segue because Doug wanted to step in. He had some uh, some points about Hagerstown that he wanted to oh. uh, to talk to you about tonight. So, Mark, I was looking up, you know, some of your minor league stats, and I wanted you to take me back to Hagerstown, early 80s. You know, you're at the beginning of your career, and I saw that Jim Palmer had a few uh, rehab starts with you guys early yeah. on. John Hart's your manager. Um, you know, can you tell me a little about, like, you know, did you learn anything from him? What was it like being around, like, you know, like one of those big leaguers for the first time? And what was that first season like for you? Well, my, my first minor league season was 83, so I went to rookie ball for a month. And uh, it's it's kind of bizarre because I dominated that. I really did. I mean, I think my area was two. Um, I went to Hagerstown, did great my first two starts. And I went home in between starts, which they were pissed, to get married. Because my wife, be uh, my being Catholic, it was a big wedding and it was planned a year in advance and they could not understand. Why are you going home? I'm like, man, I didn't know I was going to get drafted. And I was going to go to Oklahoma state. I, I was in a junior college and I went home, came back and just pitched like shit every game. The rest of that year, it was embarrassing. Emba and they had to keep me in the rotation. Cause I had a freaking cannon. I, you know, I had a big league arm through gas thought I could pitch like most hard throwers. You, you dominate through high school and all that stuff. So you think you're good. Uh, uh if you look at me and well i shouldn't speak for my brother if you look at my, you see my numbers there they were disgusting if i didn't have uh the arm i had um i would have been released if i didn't have the arm i had i should have been released and you know it was bullshit where i i felt always felt bad for my teammates i didn't deserve to be in the rotation and if you look at the lynchburg mets that year they had dwight gooden that was the year gooden struck out 299 they always say 300 but i'm pretty sure it was 299 they I think they just gave him an extra strike out there <laughs> Him and Bobby Canop, but their, their winning percentage was our winning percentage had to be close to 700, and yet Lynchburg beat us out. And it went down to the final weekend. And it was Bobby Canapa, this guy who'd been in AAA against Dwight Gooden. Gooden beat us one nothing. I think he punched out 13. I pitched the second game at a doubleheader, and I just remember thinking, I'm as good as good. And all I kept thinking, because I threw hard, I didn't know how to pitch. So I learned nothing from Jim Palmer because I was a hard thrower and it was awesome being watching him pitch. It was awesome listening to him in the locker room. And it was Jim Palmer. We grew up baseball cards and everything else. So that was a thrill. I got his autograph. Um, 
but I didn't learn anything. Unfortunately, I didn't learn anything until I blew my arm out. So then how does that compare to when you came back, uh, you know, that first year back with the Yankees and the minors in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Cleet Boyer is your manager. Uh, you're a few years older now. What's the mindset different? Uh, huge night and day, night and day. My brother, Kurt always would talk to me. Uh, Kurt, like I told you, Kurt went to Oklahoma state and played about five years, four or five, five years in the minors. I forget. Um, got to double A. He didn't make the bigs. And Kurt would always say, you know, Mark, when you get better, when, and I'm like, man, I ain't pitched in three years when I get better. I wouldn't say it to him because he was being positive, but I just kept thinking, I'm not getting better, man. Nothing's happening for me. But he was always very positive. But one thing I used to always say to myself, if I ever get a chance to pitch again, I am not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid of getting beat. I'm not going to be afraid of getting giving up bombs. I'm not going to be afraid to pitch inside. I'm not going to be afraid if somebody wants to kick my ass for pitching inside. I'm going to pitch like my life depends on it and I'm not going to ever bitch. And when I got my opportunity, I felt that way. So I felt more mature, more confident. And I liked Cleet Boyer a lot. He was a fun manager. I was only with him for a, a short period, but then we got to be together at AAA. Um, he would say this, fellas, there's only three leagues you want to play in. The American League, the National League, or the Florida State League. The rest of the leagues suck. <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> bus rides triple a you're on getting up at four o'clock to go to the uh, airport yeah that's what he would say because in triple in uh, florida state league they're all big league parks they're spring training it was beautiful but that's what he would say i always like that um but yes i was much more mature and i wasn't afraid to fail and i wasn't afraid to throw a three two backdoor slider with the bases loaded in the tie game so i pitched with confidence um I, and my control was outstanding. In, in fact, in AAA, I was voted, uh, you know, that tools of the trade, Ameri uh, uh, tr uh, best control pitcher, International League. Um, to go from walking about 4,000 guys in 1984 in one season to being the best control pitcher was one of the highlights of my career, even though it was in AAA, not the big leagues. Um, because I was a flame throw, you know, I was a hard thrower. I reached back and here, hit this, and they did hit it. When you go 2-0 and on hitters, they're going to hit the next one. Um, so when I made the comeback, I didn't throw as hard. I wasn't a flamethrower anymore. But I learned to spot the sinker much better, you know, pitch inside, move the ball, whatever. And then I developed a good fork ball. Um, but, yeah, more mature. I was 26. Uh, you're looking at the young kids are bitching about dumb shit. Batting practice is dragging. Really? Batting practice is dragging today? Okay. I just remember, like, having to break up a fight with another guard in the jail a couple of years ago. I'll, I'll suffer with the long <laughs> You know, so I stopped. In fact, I would walk away from any, even in the big, it was a long time my career. Being around negative guys that would kind of always, you always got guys that whine about shit. You know, they're just, there's just people like that in life, right? They might be nice guys, but I always tried to walk away from it because I don't want to get dragged into that. You're complaining that this game's taken forever and all of that stuff. Um, it's a baseball game. Who gives a shit? You don't want to take it to it and quit. Yeah, honey, I'm doing a uh, thing on the phone. Want to join so there's a no, not at all. Huh? So Might have been a, there's a lot uh, right now about you know there's there's a, a movement in baseball right now where there's a lot of young guys that didn't make. Uh oh, somebody just what happened? Yeah, he just went out for a second. But yeah, so I, I what I wanted to piggyback on was about the managers. You know, the managers that you played under. I mean, it's kind of like a who's who. You got your you came in in this the, the Bucky Dent Stump Merrill era of uh, Yankee baseball, and then playing for Sparky Anderson, Terry Francona. You know, you even had Davey Lopes there in Milwaukee. It, it's the kind of thing you played under so many different personalities. Uh, you know, how do you how do you kind of adjust that going from place to place and dealing with different personalities at different managers? I was lucky. I really was. Al and I were talking the other day and um, we had some folks over here. And um, so I was, we, we were, yeah, we're going to, once you start talking, stories start coming out. But I was telling Al uh, how Dan O'Dowd screwed me over. Um, the Mets traded me to the Rockies and my contract was for 500,000. I'm having a great spring and the Mets end up trading. And I, and I had in the contract that I can ask for my release. I forget when April 1st or something, if I wasn't on the roster, so they trade me with like a week to go to Denver. I get there, make the team, and O'Dowd says, "Ah, you know what, Mark? I need you. We had to re, we had to reconfigure that. Todd Helton, Mike, <laughs> we have to reconfigure 
your contract. I'm like, really? You're going to reconfigure my contract? It's $500,000. What are you going to do? Keep it? I said, hey, you got all these. So he goes, yeah, we're going to do whatever, 300, 250, and then incentives or whatever it was. Screwed me over. Then they traded me to Milwaukee like the second day of the season. Uh, that was Davey Lopes in Milwaukee. But anyway, the, going back to manager, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking there with the uh, – Yeah, no, no, no problem. Yeah, I'm thinking about that whole Denver when you say how do you, how do you deal with all those guys. So it's not only managers. There's other other front office things. But, right. yeah, to get up with – um, it was um, – Stump Merrill was our manager in AAA. He took over for Bucky Dent. Um, and I was with Stump Merrill in AAA. Uh, Sparky, all of that. Stump Merrill, I, I had – one, I was pitching really good in AAA, uh, at, at you know for a while there, and um, I didn't pitch for I don't know how many days, and I don't understand why he didn't pitch me right. So I kept telling guys, you know, this is bullshit, man. I'm like one of the best pitchers on the team here. My numbers have been great lately. How's I'm not, you can't get to the big leagues this way. So I said, boy, if I could get on the radio show, I'm, I'm going to just tell it like it is. So what do the, my teammates do? They run, and I didn't know they run to the radio. Go, hey, you got to get lighter. <laughs> yeah, we got that big, big moth. So you got to get lighter on the show today. So he goes, okay, great. So the radio guy gets me on the show and he starts asking me. And I just said, man, I don't care. I'm just going to throw it out there. So I said, you know, no decent manager would ever have a guy sit 10 days and not get him in for an inning and get some work. And especially if the guy's one of the best pitchers in the bullpen and, uh, uh, right now. I said, it's just insane that a manager would do that. You kind of question, does he want to win? What's he doing? knowing that Stump Merrill is going to listen to this. And I'm taking a gamble that he's going to pitch me now and he's going to be pissed off. So might not have been the greatest thing to do, but I'm glad I did it. So I just said that, you know, it's just kind of BS that he did this and I haven't pitched. But So now I'm prepared. So every the, the, the pregame shows, you know, the radio shows start before a game in the minor. I don't know how it is anymore. It's probably the same. You're going to hear the, about 10 minutes before game time. You got a five-minute show. So I leave. I run out of – this was in Columbus, Ohio. If you've ever been to the old Columbus Clippers uh, place, they play it, and everybody – and I ran down to the weight room. It was in the bullpen, and I'm going, oh, my God, this is bad. It sounded horrible. I just ripped it. <laughs> so everybody – all my buddies come down. They're like, oh, my God, Stump came storming out of the office and went right into the dugout. He was, like, pissed. I said, all right, stage one starting. So <laughs> – I figured what was going to happen was I'm not itching anymore or he's going to bring me in this game tonight in a weird situation where I'm not expected. So I prepared myself mentally. If you're going to do something like this, you better be ready. Be catch, be ready for anything. So what I did was it was a brick wall, a big con- you know, cement wall behind uh, the bullpen where the catcher is. Right. So I warmed up in the first inning like I was warming up to get in a game because I just had a feeling something was going to happen. And I'm um, sure as shit. Something happens in like the third inning, fourth inning, whatever inning it was. It was early in the game where all of a sudden the phone rings, get lighter up. And everybody's like, oh, you called it. And then when Steve <laughs> asks, the wheel gets the grease. I didn't throw three pitches and he was leaving the dugout to bring me in the game. He was going to screw me over. So, so as soon as I, but I'm already loose because I was prepared for this. I'd been throwing. So just in case he did it, I'm like, I'm going to be ready. And I was right. It was a weird situation. It was the guy was throwing pretty good. Not only, so he steps out and does this immediately. So I told everybody in the bullpen, everybody turn and look at me. Nobody look at the umpire. So I just kept throwing, starting to get my you know slider, change or whatever. And you can hear the ump yelling, hey, you're in. And nobody would turn around and acknowledge him. So I got about eight <laughs> We made him run all the way down the right field line. So I came in the game and he didn't say shit. He just slammed the ball in my hand and walked off the mound. I kicked butt. I got in the rotation. Next thing you know, I was getting called up that year. Who's in the big leagues now? Stump Merrill. Stump Merrill. <laughs> Mike Witt's on the DL, and I'm up in the big leagues. And, um, in fact, it was so awesome because uh, the first week, the first uh, place we were was Texas, and Nolan Ryan was going for his 300th win the next day. So the place was – it was electricity uh, in Arlington. I get in the first night. I get in the second night, which was so cool. Being on the same mound as Nolan Ryan the first time was like, holy crap. Nolan Ryan was just pitching. It's amazing, right? Guys like that, Ryan Seaver. But, um, oh, absolutely. So, so now Mike Witt's coming off the DL, but Mike Witt was going to go down to AAA and do a, a, a rehab start. So Mike Witt comes over to me, and Rick Cerrone's locker was next to mine. Well, I should I take that back. My locker was next to his. He was there a long time, right? So Rick Cerrone's locker's there. 
Mike Witt comes over and says, hey, Mark, um, tell me about Columbus. And Rick Cerrone looks at him. He goes, don't go. And Mike goes, what do you <laughs> He goes, well, I went down on a, on a rehab assignment. It was supposed to be seven days. I was there for like a month and a half. Mike Witt heard enough right there. He got up, turned around, went to Stump's office and said, I'm not going to Columbus. I'll just start here. And so that means somebody's got to go down after the game today. So we played the game. Me, Jimmy Jones, there was about four of us. Wayne Tollinson, I believe. Well, after the game, we were headed for Chicago. So the luggage and everything is on the truck already. Um they don't tell us who's going down. So the game ends, and you can see the the guys who thought they might be going, either getting released or sent down. We were all afraid to take showers, like, ah, somebody's got to go. And then I got the dreaded tap on the shoulder. Skip wants to see us. Shit. And I go in there. Now Stump is in there, and he goes, I mean, you know, you're getting sent down. It kind of breaks your heart. You know, I was like, shit. I got a taste of this for two weeks, and now I got to go back. And Stump got the last laugh because he got to say, yeah, uh, he didn't even look at me. He didn't even look me in the face. He goes, yeah, I need you to get all your stuff and uh, you're going back to AAA. Eh, he's drinking a bear and he burps. And I'm like, oh, man, this is like payback for me getting him on the radio. I think it was, you know. And I had to go back down. And then Detroit was Sparky Anderson, Hall of Famer. Um, Dusty Baker. Fred. Yeah, I was very lucky, man. I had great managers. They were awesome. And they're all, for the most part, pretty damn good guys, too. You know? Yeah, and there's a great piece that uh, ESPN had on you. I think it was '91, where Sparky jumps on and he uh, he, he has a couple quotes about you. So it seemed like, you know, playing for Sparky Anderson for a few years, and uh, you know, he, he did have an affinity for you, and, and definitely, you know, you had a role on that team. Yeah, yeah, you know what? Sp uh, everybody was it just for the camera? I don't know. You tell me. You were there. <laughs> I'm just telling you what I watched. You know. Sparky was Sparky. You were going good. You were the man. It's, you know, whatever. He was a good dude. So many guys loved him. I'll just say this. In 91, when they put me in the rotation in the second half, in fact, it was very nice because Sparky did call me in the office. And he asked me, he goes, do you want to start or relieve? I'm like, wow. I said, I would love to be in the rotation because I only got a few starts with the uh, with the Yankees. I think I had three in that call up in set uh when i got back up in september after i went down uh, the year before so i i went in the rotation and i did great i was um in fact the other big honor i got in my career was i was voted a uh, uh, tops all-star right-handed uh, pitcher by the managers i mean it's not the media it's the managers that vote for that award and i was the right-hander they picked in 1991 so what a thrill to be voted for the tops all-star rookie team uh bagwell was on that there's a uh, bagwell luis gonzalez knoblock Ray Langford. It was pretty, pretty nice. I, what an honor, right? Oh, I went, absolutely. Oh, so we, we go into the off season. I'm thinking, man, I'm in the rotation. We start the next spring. We signed Eric King and he took my spot. And I went back in the bullpen. I couldn't believe it with that offense we had. So I ended up getting back in the rotation again in the second half. But I always wondered, man, what could I, have done? I mean, we had a great offense, Cecil and Ted, a lot of home run guys, Cecil, Tettleton. Yeah. I mean, Deer, Trammell, Whitaker were still playing great. Um, Travis Fryman. That was an offense. You can't win without any runs. So I was always bummed out that I got sent back to the bullpen. Um, I have no idea why. I mean, I was voted right-handed, best right-handed pitcher by managers. You would think I would have started out in the rotation the next year. So that always bummed me out that he did that. And, and, and honestly, the way he released me in 94 was really was, was wrong. I never dogged him back then because it's just whatever. But boy, that one stung a lot. You know, my son was dying and uh, yeah. I had great numbers. I had really good. I think I only gave up three hits. I gave up a home run. Um, I gave up a solo. I think I gave up a solo home run to somebody. But I pit, was pitching awesome. And they said, oh, we want to go a different way. I'm like, really? I'm one of the most consistent pitchers here. And he released me. But then on the other hand, I would look at it this way. Does he want to deal with a guy whose son's going to die sometime this year? That was a fact. He wasn't going to, my son wasn't going to, our son wasn't going to make it through that season. So I kind of felt, okay, the business side of it, I get it. I get it. You want to win. You don't want some guy that's going to be like, which day is this going to happen or whatever? So it always hurt me, but I felt, okay, that's the business side of it. Like the Godfather, I always tell my son, this is the profession we have chosen. You know, it's not personal, it's business and whatever, but it still hurt to get uh, released that way, you know, especially that I still went on to pitch how many more years till 2002 and you're releasing me in 94. So that, yeah. always, I don't like, you know, Sparky was obviously a loved person by so many people, 
But um, I felt he kind of punched me in the gut. And I didn't bat. Everybody wanted me to badmouth them. All the inter- ESPN, all the writers. And I just wouldn't do it. I said, you know what? Whatever, man. If it's about the business, then as long as I can pitch and whatever. You know? But it still hurt. It hurt. So I could never really like him the way other people did for that. Um, but that's the business. So you mentioned a couple guys right there, um, including Ray Langford, that have come up recently. Have you had a chance to watch this new ESPN doc on McGuire and Sosa in 98? The only thing I know about that uh, documentary is I gave up a home run to somebody, well, a couple of the dads. I do the lessons and I have a great time. We all shit talk each other. I, I treat the, the these boys as if we're all teammates in pro ball. We, I have so much fun with the kids I work with. If they're sensitive, then I don't do it until they get to know me and then I rip into them. We have, we have so much fun. <laughs> so the dad, all of a sudden, when that was on, I'm getting all these uh, YouTube. I'm like, oh man, they filmed it or whatever it was on. Me giving up the home run to McGuire. Um, that's all I know about that. I haven't watched it, but, um, I know that I gave up Mark McGuire's first National League home. I think he was one for 18 off me lifetime. Yeah. He hits like, I think it's like 120 or something like that. And you held, I mean, Sosa hits about 240, 250 off you. Yeah, McGuire's yeah. like two for 20, something like that. So you held those guys in check. Yeah. That's the two seamer man up and in. They, every guy, every muscle <laughs> thinks he did 9,000 miles, including today's players. You can't. You're not going to hit a running fastball in on your letters that starts on the black and runs in off the plate. You're not going to hit it fair. I used to make the mistake with Sheffield. Well, it wasn't a mistake. He was great. I would throw it to him on purpose and just let him hit a bunch of foul balls with it, and then hope he swung at a fork ball in the dirt. But I think there were three times. No, one was a slider. If I didn't get it in, it's going to be a home run. If I, you know, you ain't going to throw Gary Sheffield a strike on the inside corner. He's going to crush it. But if you throw it in enough, he chases it. You can't keep it fair. He'll just get strike one, strike two, strike in, and foul ball, foul ball, foul ball. You know, but McGuire and all the, I'd like to pitch those guys up and in with the two seam and run it in on them. And that kind of answers my next question. I mean, looking at your stats overall, I mean, you really faced, I mean, you know, about two dozen or so Hall of Famers there, Tony Gwynn. Uh, you know, uh, Harold Baines just got in. I mean, you know, at the time, I mean, do you do you dial up when you are facing that elite talent, or do you know what what, what do you do there? I always tried to remind myself: anybody who's got a bat can hit a home run. And I I know I gave up a shitload of home runs. Um, actually, Bill Gullickson, damn, I don't want to jump on that because he talked about that giving up home runs. Um. No, I don't. I mean, some guys just own you and that becomes intimidating. And guys like like Hall of Famer, like Frank Thomas, I remember pitching him good. Certain guys, once you pitch them good, you kind of feel your confidence is through the roof. And anytime they come up, you don't even give a shit. And then there's Rafael Palmeiro, John Olaru, Tim Raines. Palmeiro, when I saw him in the on-deck circle, I'd pee in my pants like, I can't get this guy. <laughs> Nothing. Um, he just, and he didn't just get singles. It was, I think he hit three homers, seven doubles, 18 triples and a partridge in a pear tree off me. Yeah. He, he was amazing. <laughs> I once told, um, Chuck, uh, uh, oh God, I loved him. Chili Davis. I said, man, if I ever strike this guy out, I want, I'm going to call timeout and keep the ball as a joke. Right. So we're in Camden yards and Palmyra was with the Orioles and I struck him out. I couldn't believe it. I struck him out. I think the only time I ever struck him out. And Chili Davis goes to this top step of the dugout and comes out of the dugout. Liner! Looking at the ump. Hold on! Throw the ball! And I'm like, oh my God. I'm like... (laughs) But like, embarrassed the shit out of me. Like, throw the ball in and like, keep it. Because I said I was going to do it. And I told our catcher, um, uh, mm, uh, awesome catcher, Greg Myers. Great receiver, right? I said, hey, listen, if I get 0-2, 1-2, or 2-2 two two on Palmiro, tell him what I'm going to throw. And Greg's like, I'm not. And Greg's a real nice guy, right? He's like, I'm not doing that. I said, no, I'm serious. I can't get this guy out no matter what. I can't get him out. I said, so if we, he's never going to believe you. So whatever you call, just tell him that's what it is. He's not going to expect it out of you. And Greg wouldn't do it. But I thought that would have been cool, like, to just do that to the hitter. You got to figure the hitter would have froze, right? All of a sudden, it's 2-2, two, two and the catcher yells, fastball's coming. Would the batter believe him? I have no idea, but he didn't do it. But, yeah, guys like that, you end up having no confidence with. And then the guys you get out, you just your confidence build like anything else. So you're not really worried about them coming up. 
So is Palmero one of those guys? I mean, who do you face in your career do you think isn't in the hall that belongs in the hall? Well, him, obviously. Um, well, you know what? I mean, you know, totally him. I mean, listen, I think there's guys in the, in the Hall of Fame that did steroids. Um, so if that's the case, then put him in. There's rumors about guys that I, I, you know, I believe and rumor like, you know, you didn't see the needle in his ass or wherever they do. I have no idea. I don't know what steroids are like, but then you can't prove shit. Um, if they fail tests, whatever, you didn't test everybody. You're testing certain people. Are we not supposed to do that in life anymore? Right. You only test the knees. Then test everybody. But if you've got guys in, because didn't Conseco say in his book, I never read it, but somebody told me that he said um, a Hall of Famer on that team introduced it to him. Is that true? He basically implies that uh, it's not, you know, McGuire is not in the Hall of Fame, but the book implies that McGuire introduces him to the juice. Oh, I thought Conseco said he was introduced by, uh, or there was somebody on that team who's a Hall of Famer that Could, introduced him. Which I, Reggie po Jack. Po well, possibly Reggie. Uh, the way I understood it was that, I mean, without using the word Hall of Fame, is that he always kind of threw McGuire under the bus there. Huh. Yeah. So, I, I mean, when you, if, I, if you hear those rumors when you're pitching, like, does that piss you off? Does that give you like an extra, like, want to no. get this guy out or does, you know, just kind of business as usual? Yeah. No, the only thing that upset me a few times was, um, a couple of guys hit home runs off me that cost me the, a, a game. I mean, again, I, I know I was an average pitcher. I know that. I ain't none. However, I remember, Running the guy running around the bases, not showing me up, just hitting a home run and running. I just thought, man, the fucking guy wasn't on the juice. That's a fly out, you know. And I remember thinking because it was a three run homer, um, and that happened a couple times where I would have won the game if it wasn't for home runs. And I'm not talking about McGuire's because McGuire's and Bonds, those dudes were hitting them anyway. Those you know, they didn't hit cheap home runs, you know. Um, but certain guys, it was like. But then on the other hand, I'm not even sure it was illegal. So I guess technically I could have done it if I wanted. I just wasn't going to mess around because it doesn't it mess up your ding dong or something like that with the steroids chance. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It yeah. shrinks. It shrinks things. That's uh, that's the I, uh, the thing they say. <laughs> so, um, you know, if it was legal and it's going to make me throw 100 and they were encouraging it in the training room or something, I don't know. Maybe yeah. I would have. I have no idea. I'm one of those guys like, well, all right. But I had no interest in that. So, yeah, I felt a little... I felt a little cheated there because then I started thinking, well, how much money did that cost me? This was after the stock market took everybody's money. You're thinking, well, you know, I could have made a hell of a lot more money if uh, I'd been on the juice. And then you know guys, some guys that were very honest about it saying, listen, I was a triple A big league guy and I took the gamble. And so that's always tough. But the going back to the home run, those guys, put them in the Hall of Fame. You want to put uh, in, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't even think you need to put anything. People can make their own decisions now, whether they were honored or whether they weren't. Bonds was a Hall of Famer regardless. Clemens was a Hall of Famer regardless. Um, they should have just stopped playing. You know, it, well, of course, nobody can prove that they don't want to say what about Bonds. But Bonds' numbers were Hall of Fame. He would have been there. Most of those guys, most of them would have been there. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how, what, how that I don't know how that would have played out. I mean, I don't I don't know how you go about that. You know what I mean? Because there were guys that that didn't cheat. Like, uh, well, how, you don't know who cheated and who didn't. But I look at Olerud. I couldn't get him. I thank God if he was on him, he would have probably hit six hundred home runs too, or whatever. Um, yeah. What do you do there, right? So, last question for me before I hit it to my brother for the wrap. Uh, you know, you pitched in one ear a ball. Your brother pitched in near a ball. Your son, uh, your nephew, is one of the most talked about prospects in the game. What is the commonality that unites you guys, you know, as young pitchers looking for that next step? Wait, uh, say that again. He said, what's the commonality for young pitchers trying to make that next step? To get drafted or to get into the big league? What level are you talking? So for your, you know, your nephew is one of the, uh, the, the bigger talked about prospects in the next couple of years, you know. So as far as your whole family goes, I mean, what's the similarity between going to the next step to the bigs? You know, what's the drive? Okay. Well, uh, let me add this here too. So, so Jack, congratulations, right? Uh, all American freshman. And I'm, I'm very, very happy and also humble to say two of the kids I work with, Jacob Ciccone 
and Sonny Fauci at uh, St. John's in New York also made it. So um, I'm not one that I don't put, put that stuff on my walls or anything like that, but I couldn't. I just found out two days ago, two days ago or yesterday. I think it was yesterday. I don't even know when somebody sent me that. I couldn't believe it. So my nephew and, and a couple of the other boys, I'm so happy for him. It's awesome. It's exciting. Um, for Jack, I think Jack, uh, he's ahead of Al and I were. We were throwers. Like I said earlier, we might, well, Al might disagree with me, but I, I saw how me and my brothers were. We reached back. And back in the day when we were in high school, 0-2, oh man, I might throw it behind your head. You didn't even get thrown out of the game, throw a hanging curve, strike the guy out, and thought you were good. Um, so we were just basically throwers. So Jack having Al, my son having me, we – it's about pitching. So we're teaching our kids change ups when they're younger, just because they need, you know, you need to have a great change up and you, need, you, know, you look at Pedro Martinez, he had awesome change up with a hell of a fastball and guys like that. Yeah. It's about, um, you know, reminding them, you got to work ahead. Just talk, treating them like big leaguers. I've treated my son like he's a big league teammate since he's, I don't know. He grew up in the locker room since he's, you know, a little kid, 10 years old, 11 years old when he's pitching in games. So yeah, they have the advantage unfortunately all these boys think that if they throw 95 to hundred, they're going to be in the big leagues. And I reminded my son forever. When you get to pro ball someday, if you do, you're going to be shocked at how many guys get released throwing 94, just because you throw 94, 95, that doesn't mean squat. You got guys in a ball year after year after year, because they don't figure out how to pitch. So just because you got the big arm, your dream is not to get drafted. Your dream is to be in the big league. So a lot of kids are always like, oh, I just want to get drafted. And then my son used to say that. I'm like, no, you don't. You ain't drafted. And then what? Get released? You want to play in the big leagues. And you don't want to just play in the big leagues. You want to be there till you're an old man or at least an old baseball man. So you got to start thinking like a big leaguer at a young age. Learn to throw strikes. Make sure you're getting ahead. Don't just think you're going to just overpower people because in the big leagues, everybody's – and not even big leagues, A ball, double A. Everybody can hit fastballs. So I think that, you know, what I see with those guys is they loved it enough to listen to us. Jack listened to Al, my son listened to me. So I think they're not throwers, they're pitchers. They're, they're very good pitchers. And that's what you have to be. You, you can't just think you're great because you throw hard. You have to know that these guys are going to be trying to hit me constantly. So I remind my son, this is what I would always remind him, you don't let up. You bury people. Until that manager does this, on his hand to take you out, you go balls out and you attack and attack and attack. I don't give a shit if you're giving up home run, double, double, double. You keep going hard at every level, high school, college, rookie ball, A ball. You don't ever quit on yourself. So I think my son, I don't know how many dads would be doing that with kids, um, reminding him that it's a business. The minute you, especially my son, he doesn't have the Jack Lighter fastball. Jack, I think, touched 98 last year. In fact, I know he did because Al showed me the picture of the radar gun hitting 98. That's unbelievable. My son don't do that. Not 98. So I tell him, man, you got to be you, you got to be an animal. Out there. You can't you can never let up, man, because once you do, someone's going to knock you on your ass and you'll get released like that. My son brought this up to me recently. He goes, you remember the first advice you gave me, Dad, after we hugged? And it was emotional when he got drafted, especially by the Phillies, man. We grew up going here to Philly all our life. We were Mets fans, but we also loved the Phillies because it was close to where we grew up. And I hugged my son. I was so proud. And I said, remember, you have two bad games in a row and they might release you. I let him know right from the I, – I keep it real because that's the damn truth. Forget that celebrating shit. Now it's just beginning. So you got about one day to enjoy that you were drafted, and now it's time to focus like a big leaguer again. And I remember Dickie Knowles saying I didn't get to see my son's first outing in pro ball. It was down in rookie ball down there. And Dickie said he went over because it was my son. Dickie and I were teammates in, in Columbus in 89, um, which was awesome. What a great human being he is, right? Dickie Knowles, if you know him. Um, he said, he calls me up and he's like, oh, my God. He, the bases he loaded, an infield hit, an error, and I think a hit batsman or a, a sack bunt gone wrong. Bases loaded, nobody out. And Dickie said, I walked over to the backstop. I said, now I got to see what this kid's made of. It was his first pro outing. He punched out the next three guys. And Dickie just said, he walked away going, now that's the lighter, man. He just went right after. <laughs> He's not a flamethrower. So he had the crazy shit happen with the bases loaded. And then boom, boom, boom. That was it. That's knowing how to pitch and not giving up and not get. It's your first pro outing. You got the managers watching. The scouts are behind there. That's, that ain't easy. That's not easy. It sounds easy. I don't give a shit if it's rookie ball or the big leagues. It's not easy doing that first one. And, oh, shit, more than shit. None of them are easy. But to do it that first way, and he did it that way, tells me 
He learned correctly. He listened. He paid attention, and he went out and proved it right there. So I don't know if that answered your uh, question there, but that's a tough question to be honest with you. So you you say they took advantage of the lighter advantage, huh? They they really uh, <laughs> they see that's how we bring it full circle, huh? Exactly. So they took advantage of all the years of uh, knowledge and the uh, consumption of the lighter <laughs> advantage. <laughs> Gone. I like I, I told you. Remember, I forgot. I forgot to be on the show. I was doing lessons and hanging with the dads. And thankfully, you texted me to remind me. I'm like, shit, I would have forgot. Hey, that's what it's all about. But uh, yeah, I'm going to wrap it up here now. I mean, this has been an amazing conversation. I told you we'd have a lot of fun when we uh, when we talked. <laughs> I don't I don't lie when I uh, when I put that proclamation out there. But uh, if they want to find out more about Mark Leiter, it's uh, lighteradvantage.net where they can find out about what you I guess what you offer in terms of your uh, you know your program. But please, you know, the floor is yours if you'd like to give it the proper uh, lighter advantage pitch. Oh well, thank you. I didn't expect that. That's very oh, nice. <laughs> I appreciate it. Listen, I love doing lessons. I've been offered jobs to coach professionally. I have uh, daughters at home that I want to be with. I get to watch my son always play. So I love baseball and I love doing the lessons. Um, I have a lot of fun. I'm one of those guys. I don't even put a time in. It's not even like I charge it like by the hour. It's just come over and let's just do it. And sometimes I have parents here for two hours, two, two and a half hours. We're done. We hang out talking. Um, I'm all in mechanics, learning how to pitch. See, here's what th this is one thing that the kids should know. Just because you're throwing 90, 93, doesn't mean you know how to pitch. I like getting kids, I'll get them young. And by the time they're going through high school, I'm constantly telling them, okay, the count's 2-0. and you got a six-run lead. The cleanup hitter's up. There's only a man on first here, and there's two outs. What are you going to throw? Give them a two-seamer down the middle. And the, you know, I, But I want to hear what they say. Or you know, it's a 3-1 count. It's a one-run game. It's first and third. What are you going to throw here? So I'm always talking about counts and setting up hitters and what do you, so this way here, if they get into pro bowl and I forget pro bowl, even in high school, when you're on the mound, no matter what's going to happen, I've been talking to you about it all winter. When we do our pitching, we, I constant. So they're always being fed a scenario that's going to happen. How many times my son said to me throughout high school, college, even the minor leagues that third inning today, remember how you were telling me the story four years ago that my son loves the, if somebody loves the game, they're going to remember this stuff. It happened today in the game. And I always say, Mark, I don't remember, but I'm proud as hell that you do and that you did listen to me back in all those days. And I like to do that with all the kids. So once I get their mechanics good and they're staying back, stay close, you know, do all the important things not to get hurt. Now I like to talk pitching and we do it and we do it at length. And because it's in my, my, on my property, I don't have to tell anybody to go home. There's no next. Okay. Your time is up. Leave. That's great. Yeah. I might have four kids here and we're just all bullshitting about pitching and, and whatever. So I have a lot of fun, and if I wasn't going to have fun, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it, so I love it. You can tell. Thank you. you can tell from our conversation yesterday and the conversation today that you do, and it's uh, it's awesome. I can just tell you being, that. Hey, I was being a wise ass with you on the phone. I was, I was yeah. you know, <laughs> I don't know who you're talking to. I was having fun. Hey, I pa did I pass the test, though? Did I did I make the awesome. – uh, Yeah, no, this was, <laughs> no, absolutely fantastic. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, I appreciate you coming on tonight and spending time on a beautiful uh, night there in New Jersey. Uh, wish I could be there, but I'm down here in Virginia, back in the homeland, if you will. So uh, I, I appreciate everything and I hope to talk to you again. This was a, a ton of fun. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you.